Starting again. Are we starting again? You're listening to That Gets My Goat. You should know better. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of That Gets My Goat. I am Big Anklevich. And I am Rich Outfield. And this is going to be a small yes. episode of That Gets My Goat. Tiny. It's very small. Ant-sized. Except for when it goes giant-sized, then what is it going to be? A uh, pain in the ass to edit. Giant-sized man-thing? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Marvel Cinematic Universe presents Man Thing Origins. <laughs> Man Thing Origins Wolverine. Daniel Day Lewis is Man Thing. Coming this Christmas. <laughs> Coming Christmas 2026. Yes, they scheduled them that far ahead now. All right, so uh, we both saw Giant-Sized Man-Thing this weekend, (laughs) (laughs) and uh, we're not going to talk about that because that was just a porn movie that he recommended I watch, so... (laughs) For the cinematography, right? I mean, come on. It was, yeah, it was for that. The lighting was really well done. It was very classy. But no, actually, we saw Ant-Man and the Wasp. That is the official title, right? Yes. Now, if I remember correctly, you didn't love the last Ant-Man movie. You, you do remember that correctly. Yeah, it just, it never spoke to me. At, I mean, you know, I'm going to go a step further. It just never worked for me. It was supposed to be a much more comedic Marvel film than we had seen, but it didn't make me laugh like Guardians did. I, I, I can't even explain what it is about the movie I only ever saw it that one time with you, and then the boys would watch it on like uh, on demand from time to time, and so I caught little bits and pieces here and there of it, but it always rubbed me the wrong way. I don't know, I asked my cousin about it, because he's the one I saw with the second one with, and, and I said, what did you think of that? And he's like, oh, I loved everything about it, except for the wasp's hair. <laughs> <laughs> so we can go back to that at some point in this discussion. But so I, I can't even really express what it was. I remember on that episode trying to put into words what it was that I disliked about it. And I, I, I think the comedic elements just didn't, they weren't funny to me. They were more annoying. I felt like all of uh, Scott Lang's friends were irritating rather than amusing. But they were all back in this one, and I didn't have a problem with them. And I, I just, I'm not sure what the problem was. The hmm, uh, that's... the fact that Peyton Reed, the director, came on board at the very last minute and had very, very little to do with, you know, the script and all that stuff might have had something to do with it. But that shouldn't make the movie less funny. So Peyton Reed came on board the last minute of the old Ant-Man. Of the first one, yeah. I remember Edgar the Wright was movie. developing that for years. And yeah, I do remember he and Marvel him. just butted heads and he walked away from the project. And they said, no, you know what? It's still going to make its release date. We got a new director and uh, here he is. And he just sort of picked up from where they left off. But on this one, you know, he had three years to uh, develop and this, you know, the script and all that. So this is the same director. Same again. guy, yeah, except for he actually manned this one from the beginning. Uh-huh. Uh, but, well, sorry, let me ask you what you remember about the first Ant-Man, because you also haven't seen it since the first, since the theater. Yeah, <laughs> the sad thing is I own the DVD, but I haven't seen it since the the first time that I watched it. I've probably seen it less than you. Uh, the reason I own the DVD is because my daughter wanted it. She kept asking for it over and over again. She wanted to see it. I guess she was a big fan when she saw it in the theater and wanted to uh, to see it again. And uh, we eventually bought the DVD. I think she wanted to like rent it. I don't know if you've ever done the renting thing that you can do with like Amazon or something where you pay way more than you should. <laughs> And you get the the thing for like a day and you can watch the file or whatever for a day and then it goes away. I've found that they they usually make you pay like five bucks or more just to rent the damn thing for a day. And I figure, okay, so five bucks for one day or 20 bucks to own it. Uh, I guess I'll just own it. That's what we did. 
and yeah, I own the movie, but yeah, I don't, I don't think I ever saw it again. I don't remember like when when there was the parts early on in the movie where you see Hope's hair. I don't remember it being like that. I suppose I should because uh, Janet Van Dyne has always had that kind of little pixie cut in all of the anything that I've ever seen that has the wasp in it. So I should have remembered that that's the way. It was. But I didn't. I didn't remember it. I hated it. It was awful. <laughs> But uh, I'm sure all of our listeners that have a similar haircut look really cute with that hair. So don't take it personally. Um, probably most of what I remember about that movie is his friends. And uh, their kind of goofy dynamic. And the weird thing is that I think I'm the opposite of you. They didn't bug me last time around. But they did this time? I enjoyed them, but this time around, it felt like it was trying way too hard. It felt like they were trying to get that same thing that they had back then and just weren't quite succeeding or something. I don't know. But um, I think I prefer the first movie to this one. <laughs> hmm. I still enjoyed it okay. But there was just a, several times where I'm just like, uh. I think maybe the addition of the FBI agent who basically seemed like uh, one of their friends from college that they must have like, one of them moved to, you know, New York. And so they didn't hang out for a while. And then he came back and now he's an FBI agent. So they couldn't be friends anymore. But they still talked the same. Like, what was the deal with that FBI agent guy that was basic what, do you remember the names of any of his friends no i don't know the names but of. you can certainly use ethnicity for us to know which one you're talking about yeah you could there was the the main friend who was the hispanic dude basically that the asian fbi agent seemed like a carbon copy of the hispanic dude just like fast talking kind of like goofy and and a little awkward with everything that he said and like you know always like the end thing where he says i'll see you later and he goes what uh like do you have plans oh no well uh i mean i, I could go get something i'm, I'm kind of hungry <laughs> do you want to go out to dinner i don't know it just seemed too like they were reaching too much to try and be funny i thought it was uh more effortless and more legit in the first one although that could just be that I was in a different place back then. And if I watched it now, I'd feel the same way. I haven't seen it since it was new. And maybe I'm just older and more curmudgeonly now. <laughs> I don't know. To tell you the truth, it kind of bummed me out that I found that to be uh, more frustrating than I wanted it to be. Well, that's, that's okay. I might have had that conversation with people about Iron Man 3. There are people that really, really love that movie, and I sort of wish that I could. I just don't. But yeah, see, I, I, I totally dug Ant-Man and the Wasp. I, but, you know, I guess I do see... I, it had a bunch of, like, subplots and characters that seemed like they were straight out of one of those 70s Disney movies with, like, Kurt Russell... The computer wore tennis shoes kind of stuff. Uh huh. Where it was that darn cat, or yeah, where it was all just aimed at like a teen audience or whatever, and <laughs> and the light, fair, and sort of formulaic and not to be taken seriously. Because like the the Walton Goggins character, the the corrupt gangster businessman guy that Hope had been dealing with. You know who I'm talking about? The Southern guy continue with the stereotypes yeah he just <laughs> seemed like he was out of a different movie and we've never seen a guy like that on a marvel movie because it, it's too low stakes you know what i mean it's too low rent for a marvel movie it's like he he has numerous health code violations at his restaurant Ooh, he's a bad <laughs> dude and yeah the the randall park character the uh, the well-intentioned put upon FBI guy felt like something that's just like, yeah, I'll, I'm going to get that shaggy DA. <laughs> he does. 
does feel that way. He doesn't feel like a real uh, FBI. He's so cheesy or something that you you can't take him as a real threat. Like when he's like, oh, let's go get him. And they're going down to catch him being away from his house or whatever. It just seems silly a lot of the time. It feels almost kind of like a sitcom or something where there's just like the hijinks are going on. It's <laughs> it's a glorified episode of Zack and Cody. <laughs> oh, wow. That is low <laughs> praise, sir. But the, the thing was, I, I know that I'm, I'm making it sound like I absolutely hated it, but I didn't. I still enjoyed it. It didn't feel as much like a Marvel movie maybe because of that. Or maybe that's better. I don't know. I mean, we just had Infinity War, which was low on comedic moments, really high on bad things happening, awful, everybody dying, worlds ending, etc., etc., So maybe this is what we needed to follow that up with. You know, you got to have something that's a little more fun, a little more silly, a little more wacky and crazy. And when it comes down to it shrinking and and growing things, it's more of a fun power than, I don't know, having a giant hammer that you can (laughs) shoot lightning with or something. Uh, Yes. And I I thought that they did wonders with the premise of shrinking and growing things. Oh, yeah. There was a hundred different, like, little gags of stuff that we hadn't seen before. And, you know, the, the stuff with the van getting smaller and bigger and a, a chase through uh-huh. San Francisco and with, you know, narrow escapes and the <laughs> bouncing underneath the the guy that's after you and then growing big so you take him out. And I don't know. I've just found all of that really delightful and inventive. Yeah, I, I love that stuff. In ways that are like, oh, yeah, that's, oh, cool. And now they can shrink other objects. Oh, cool. Like when they throw the freaking Pez dispenser out and it just turns into a gigantic thing and takes out a car. And I I love their little Hot Wheels carrying case that's just full of cars that can shrink and grow and they can just switch them out. That was awesome. Uh, And yeah, there was a lot of awesome to it. So I don't want to make it sound like I hated it. But yeah, it did feel like it tried a little too hard in some places. And I think the FBI agent being the way he was might have been the clincher for me. You know, you you can only have so many characters like that. And maybe uh, on top of it, that one bit with the truth serum when our southern gangster guy comes in. And they give the Hispanic guy his... Uh, I want to look this guy's name up. I don't want to just keep calling him Hispanic guy the whole show. Okay. Hold on a second. You can say Michael Pena if you want. Michael Pena. Luis, okay. Sonny Birch is who Walton Goggins played. You know, it's weird. I Yeah, I was looking up... I, in fact, I have the Wikipedia page in front of me, so I should have uh, been able to help you out. Dang it, I didn't even think about it. But yeah, Sonny Birch is from the comics. Is he? Yeah. Just, I mean, uh, it's funny that he was just like a, a very minor Iron Man villain or something like that that they decided to throw yeah. in there. And and so when they had the truth serum and uh, Sonny Birch comes in and uh, administers it to uh, Louise, um, <laughs> to his character, I don't know. I, there's that too. Like, Sonny Birch is kind of a goofy guy, and his sidekicks are kind of goofy. And, like, why are they having this long fight over whether Truth Serum is a real thing or not a real thing? It was kind of fun to see Michael, because Michael Pena's character, I don't know, the way he tells stories, and, and I think my favorite part about him is when they would have him telling the story. But it would cut away to other people talking. (laughs) They would say things. Because it was still his voice talking. She's like, say this. And he does the the head movement. And then it cuts to, and you see Evangeline Lilly or whatever, doing the same kind of head movements and stuff. As they tell their, you know, summations of their lines that Michael Pena gives them. I really did like the way that they would do that. Okay, well, let's talk about the main, the A story, as they say, you know, the... Oh, okay. Scott Lang. Well, I guess is is the A story Hank Pym 
trying to rescue his wife from the quantum realm? Or is the A story Scott Lang only having a couple days left on his sentence and trying not to uh, rock the boat? No, I think him only having a couple days left in his sentence is like the extenuating circumstances. You know what I mean? It's like... Here's this that has to happen now, but now there's also some wackiness because he's only got two days left and he can't be seen out. Okay. (laughs) So yeah, I think Hope and Hank trying to save their mother is, is the big main story. The one thing that I really liked about the A story is our villain... She wasn't really a villain, as it were. You know what I mean? She just needed the same thing for a different reason. She was a really sympathetic kind of character. You know, you you see her and you think, oh, you know, she's really scary and she does some scary stuff when they first introduce her. And then you see her get home and she has to go into this freaking, like, Michael Jackson, you know, cryo chamber bubble to sleep in. Because she can barely keep it together. And then you're like, oh, no, I, I kind of want her to be okay, too. And I kind of liked that. I really liked that idea. So it's, it's almost like a civil war kind of a thing, you know, where you just pit two sides against each other. And they're not really either of them bad guys. Uh, although Ghost was a little more of a bad guy because she was kind of been used by shield as an assassin or something you know she had a little she was a little more morally gray than uh, our heroes were and uh, luckily she had Lawrence Fishburne to keep her in line but yeah I really I, I liked that facet of the story that's that's interesting I I was terrified by ghost but uh, mostly just there was something about her face that really upset me yeah yeah, I just I I asked my cousin afterward, well, did she scare you? And he's like, no. And so uh, I don't know. Your cousin was missing something because she did have a scary look to her when she would. I think because most of the time, also she was meant to look kind of haggard. Were her eyes really that color? You think? Does that actress really have that color of eyes, or did they do something to her eyes? Oh, you know, you that, see a regular picture. that could have explained a bit why I was so unnerved by her, that she had contact lenses on or something. You know, I, I, that didn't even occur to me. I just thought they had either made her look frightening, you know, in some way, because she's, she's like a, somebody that's hooked on painkillers and... Right. You know, it can't think straight anymore. And she's she's like a scary junkie that you find in your uh, garage in the middle of the night. Right. If that's too specific an example, then uh, we can cut that out. <laughs> but uh, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you were there. Yeah, I remember the junkie that I found in my garage late at night. Yeah. Yeah, you called me scary. like the next day. <laughs> Anyhow, so that that's I, she just scared me. And I didn't like her in the way that you like her. I was always scared of her. Yeah. And, but when she's redeemed at the end of the movie, I thought, oh, well, it will be interesting to see how this dynamic either changes or doesn't change. I would hope that she's still deadly and vicious and cannot be depended upon and all that stuff. And she'll be like a, a part of the team, but one of those team members that, you know, doesn't see it the same way as the the other team members one of them that's always uh, on the side yeah an anti-hero kind of thing rather than being fully rehabilitated by the next time we see her the one that they're always wondering whether they can trust her to do things the right way or something you know right like can you do this can you do this without killing people yeah yeah i i, I can see that I still can't tell for sure if her eyes are really that color. I looked at some older pictures and they look like they might have been darker. But either that or she wears those contact lenses a lot. I think she has oddly clear eyes, very, very light colored eyes, which is often unnerving. Especially on a dark haired person, it seems even weirder. Because it doesn't happen very often. Okay, see, I'm glad that you said it. Because when I say it, people are like, you don't like Rihanna because... I'm like, oh, did I? I didn't mention <laughs> Rihanna. I, 
I was talking about uh, Taylor Swift. It's like, you always talk about Taylor. <laughs> oh, I can't win. But uh, <laughs> I like Rihanna because of her eyes. So there. F you. But F yeah, you and all that you love. But Ghost also had Bill Foster on her side. And he was an antagonist to our characters as well. But he was clearly a good man. Right. Who was pitted against our heroes. And I thought that that was neat, too. Yeah, and an interesting thing, too, about it is you get the two different sides of her origin. So Ghost, she was treated poorly by Hank Pym when he was younger and her dad had to go to Argentina and continue his experiment in secret. And it was all his fault that this happened because he was a meanie. And then there was the other where he says, no, that was that's a load of crap. He's been filling her with lies. And this guy was actually a, a spy and he was, you know, stealing our, he stole the idea. You know, and you never know. You don't find out. You don't get a confirmation of, yeah, that's the way it went. Or, yeah, this is the way it went. We just hear the two different sides and we have to decide, do we believe Bill Foster or do we believe Hank Pym? Hank Pym is a drunk who beats his wife. So I don't know really much about Bill Foster. He was Goliath once, so he died in the Civil War, but that's not part of this universe. So I don't know. <laughs> well, I, until you brought up that uh, aspect of, of Hank Pym's history, I was going to bring up that, uh, you know, he was one of the more flawed characters that Stan Lee came up with, a, a heroic character who was difficult to like at the best of times. And I, I couldn't remember whether Michael Douglas played him that way in the first movie, where he was he was nasty and he had even pushed his daughter away. It seems like Hank Pym was one of those guys who burned bridges everywhere he goes and has no friends because of it. But in this movie, clearly he has this relationship with Hope, and he just seemed a little more curmudgeonly, but not not a nasty character at all. How was he in the first movie? Do you remember? He was similar as he is in this movie. He had, uh, curmudgeonly is probably a good way to put it, but he was also, you know, the, the more the, the wise old curmudgeon that you, you know, you have to put up with his curmudgeonness because he's got so much to offer kind of a thing, as opposed to what he is in the comics where he's a much darker character that uh, has got serious problems. And, you know, they've done that with a lot of characters. Like, Iron Man's supposed to be a total drunk, but not in this universe. He's still, you know, playboy, you know, a playa, kind of a jerk, sometimes, to certain people. But much more likable, even, than Michael Douglas is in these, you know. So it's... <sighs> that was one thing that is interesting about Marvel characters is they always try and give them some kind of fatal flaw that they have to rise above. But yeah, they didn't go as heavy onto that with a lot of the stuff in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Which I suppose is fine. I don't know. Okay, well, uh, you've been dying to talk about this, but let's talk about Janet Van Dyne as played by Michelle Pfeiffer. Oh, you know, my favorite part of the whole movie probably was is when Janet Van Dyne somehow beams into Scott Lang's head <laughs> and suddenly he starts acting like her. That part, that part was so great. When he was like holding Hank Pym's hand. Yeah. Yeah, he holds his hand and he like kisses his daughter or her daughter on the forehead and starts acting completely different. Just totally cracked me up. It was probably the best acting that I've ever seen from Paul Rudd. I just really loved that part. But I love Michelle Pfeiffer. I, I have to admit, Michelle Pfeiffer... Uh, I, was, I actually mentioned it to my wife when I got home from the movie. And I was just saying, man, Michelle Pfeiffer, she's... What, 30 years beyond what she was when she was Catwoman? But I still think she's just as gorgeous. Uh, she's still so gorgeous. Like, in this movie, she had, like, white hair, basically. 
And to me, it just made her look hotter. How well did you sleep on the couch? <laughs> well, the funny thing was, I just said, uh, yeah, Michelle Pfeiffer, I just, she's my Colin Firth. And by, <laughs> by saying that, I deflected all possibility of retaliation. Nice. So, yeah, she couldn't, uh, couldn't complain about anything. But, uh, you played the Firth card. I would have thought, you know, now that she's 30 years older, I wouldn't be as attracted to her, but I guess I'm 30 years older too, so it makes sense. But uh, I have got an unhealthy thing for Michelle Pfeiffer, so I really appreciated her role in this movie. Just seeing her made me happy. Did you know she was going to be in it? Did they give that away in the trailers or... I want to say that you may have mentioned it to me once, though. You may have texted me one time and said, Hey, they cast Michelle Pfeiffer in Ant-Man. Who do you think she's going to play? And I said, Catwoman. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, she, I mean, you see her at the very first friggin' scene of the film, though, so it's not a, a surprise later. Are you tired of those let's show our characters younger scenes that open all these movies now? Because I, I get joy from every single one. You know, just seeing uh, Michael Douglas, the way he looked back then, or, you know, whoever happens to be in these scenes, seeing Robert Downey Jr. when he was, you know, like 16 or however old that he was supposed to be there. I love that stuff. They do a good job with him, you know. It's not creepy I don't, know, I don't know how to say it it's not like princess leia in uh rogue one it, i don't know it works it doesn't bother me it shouldn't be hard because they have the actual actress to be there and then they also have a bajillion movies that all these people were in that they can use for any reference if they need a reference well we got to see young Michael Douglas and young Michelle Pfeiffer and young Lawrence Fishburne. And I just thought that that was kind of cool. Because right? my assumption is in Captain Marvel, we will get to see some of these characters young as well. And especially Samuel L. Jackson. I, I haven't seen any pictures of what he looks like in Captain Marvel, but I've heard him say that, you know, he has both of his eyes. <laughs> and I'm assuming he will have hair. Because oh. there's a picture of him with... Robert Redford in Winter Soldier, and he's got hair in that, but uh, that might have been 40 years ago. <laughs> he looked just like he did in Pulp Fiction. <laughs> <laughs> I think it takes place around then. I wonder if they were tempted at all, because it just, it, it would be ridiculous to do that, unless he was like <laughs> undercover in some, you know, he had infiltrated some organization and he's mm -hmm. got like a giant fro and stuff. <laughs> Just to sort of trick the audience into thinking this is what he was going to look like the rest of the movie. Oh, yeah. And then he's bald for the rest. But that would be fun. I, I, I would like to see that. Them try something like that. Yeah, it's just the opening scene. Of course, I don't know how big his part is in Captain Marvel. At this point, you know, we haven't seen any trailers or anything. I thought we'd get something for that in this. But instead, we, we got... Uh, well, I guess I, I had said, I imagine, that the end of Ant-Man and the Wasp will be the same as the ending of Infinity War. But when it happened, the mid credit sequence, and they were talking about going into the quantum realm to get healing energy so they could fix Ghost permanently? Isn't it, is that what you got out of that? Yeah, something like that. Like, I don't know if Ghost needs continual infusion of this stuff or something but um yeah they said they needed to get it for their ghost friend well i was just like oh okay well i have no idea what's going on here this is clearly like a setup for the next ant-man movie okay they aren't going to address the whole <laughs> and then he he loses contact with the others and instantly i knew i was right that this is what had happened, and I was just like, oh, no. But the funny thing is, and, and uh, yeah, maybe let's talk about this for like a minute and a half. Okay. Well, let me start the timer. Hold they on. went subtle with it to the point where uh, I went, oh, and I clapped my hands, <laughs> and other people were still getting it, and then they showed the ash, and all of them were dead. And my nephew, who I saw it with, asked me, I don't, I don't understand what happened. 
And I wondered, well, how many other people then right, in the audience right. didn't understand what happened? Because they didn't beat you over the head with what just happened. You know, if you got it, you got it. If not, you just know that Scott is in trouble for some reason. Yeah, you just know that something happened. You, you might probably think of it as, oh, yeah, this is uh, leading into the next movie. Some bad guy just zapped them somehow. <laughs> I wondered if, just based on my nephew's reaction, if they should have been a little more blunt with it. And I thought maybe they needed one more shot where the camera goes over the side of the building and shows people turning to ash, every second person turning into ash down there. And then it goes to black. But I don't know. I mean, these things are a judgment call of how obvious you go and and yeah you can get like really bad underestimating the audience's intelligence you know the example i always go to and you know which example i'll go to right uh go to the example and i'll see if i'm ready for it (laughs) (laughs) from the ending of uh revenge of the sith where just in case audiences didn't realize that this wookie that we've seen Uh in other movies is the wookie that you're thinking it is we're going to have Yoda specifically say his name. And just, yeah, it was so unnatural. It was just like, thank you for your help. Chewbacca. <laughs> yes. And then he turned to the camera and winked at everybody and pointed with his thumb. Yeah, that was a little over the top. Okay, this guy is. And I was <laughs> like, geez, dude. And, and, they, and they did that in the special edition when not only Boba Fett has a cameo, but he turns and looks at the camera. Hey, guys, it's me. And I was just like, well, <laughs> that's not how he talked in the first movie. Anyhow, uh, <laughs> just there, there's a fine line between, whoa, 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 ju- what just happened, guys? And uh, beating you over the head with it. And so right. I, I think that it was kind of brave that they ended the movie the way they did. I mean, way more people saw Avengers 3 than we'll see Ant-Man and the Wasp. So they're kind of covered. Most people will get that reference. Yeah, I would think so. But, you know, for such they a light did have movie. have the very, very end scene with the ant still playing the drums uh, while the TV was saying, like, service interrupt. What, what is it that it had on the screen? It said emergency or whatever. You know, they, they did give you a... Dear Odin on his golden throne... I hated that post credit <laughs> moment. It's it's fine because I always stay anyway. Even if there wasn't a post credit s- sequence, I would stay. But it was just like, oh, guys. And they had the temerity to have shown that in the trailer, too. Ew. <laughs> just, just don't have one then. <laughs> but but I take I I, I, I withdraw forty percent of my criticism. Because then it said, Ant-Man and the Wasp will return. Yeah, the question mark was, huh? You're like, "Uh uh-oh. I did dig that a lot. Uh, I remember, and I don't know if I mentioned this when we did our Infinity War episode, but at the end of Infinity War, it comes up and it says, (laughs) Thanos will will return. return. I remember somebody like sitting next to me in the theater goes, ah. I've had enough of that guy. <laughs> they were not interested in the return of Thanos. Well, as a um, a lead-in to Avengers Four, that really got me thinking. You know, the the Scott being stuck in the quantum realm and ending it there, because I I just thought, well, how important is Ant Man in Avengers Four? Are, are we going to actually dedicate some of the runtime of that movie to getting him out of there, helping him out? And I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I, I have no idea what's going to happen in Avengers 4. Do, do you think that they would dare say that it's been a year since more than half of the Earth's population died? And when I say oh. more than half, it's because anybody flying a jumbo jet that disappears kills everybody aboard that jumbo jet or anybody driving a school bus kills everybody aboard that school bus. 
Any doctor that had a whole list of surgeries that day kills all those people on the list. Right. Any school guidance counselor kills all of their students just because it sucks to be a guidance counselor. Yeah, because they just eventually go crazy and do bad things. I, uh, there's a guy that I work with one of the reporters who <laughs> he's one of the few people for some reason where I work there's not a lot of nerds there there's there's nobody like me but since I'm the one guy who shows up wearing like Captain America t-shirts to work all the time this guy knows that that you know I'm cool he could talk to me about Marvel so <laughs> he always every time he sees me asks me about this movie and that movie and he was telling me, oh, yeah, are you excited about Ant-Man? I hear that, uh, you know, something about this quantum realm is going to be a big thing in the next Infinity War. You know, the Infinity War sequel. Something about the quantum realm is going to be how they go back and undo Thanos' victory. And then I saw him today. And he's like, oh, yeah, did you see it? And I said, yeah. And, you know, we talked for a second about it. And then I said, so what did you what did you learn about this quantum realm? Is there something that you see? And he goes, oh, uh, well. So I still think there's, you know, the powers that she had from being down in there. Maybe Scott's going to come out with something or something's going to. Or they went down and they harvested all that quantum energy or whatever. You know, when he comes out. And he he didn't seem very concerned about Scott being stuck down there. Because apparently, you know, Scott went down there once before. In the end of the first movie. And came out on his own. So, that's what we're expecting him to do. Now, here's a question for you. What did Michelle Pfeiffer eat for those 30 years that <laughs> she was living in the quantum I realm? imagine they were those big spore-looking walrus creatures. <laughs> <laughs> Those giant worms. Somebody had that as the, that kind of a worm as like their profile picture on Facebook. One of the fans of the show. I really? That all the time. Oh, that's cool. I got to check that out. Yeah, some some college is going to adopt that as their mascot because it used to be <laughs> the uh, I don't know baby rapers or something something that you're just not allowed to have anymore <laughs> as your mascot for for uh, 150 years. It was totally fine. Yeah, but now all of a sudden we're starting to realize that, yeah, that's just not okay. <laughs> so now they're going to be the earworms. The the Loyola Marymount Quantum Worms. <laughs> I wonder what the mascot is for the Loyola Marymount. I don't know. You'd have to be a fan of college basketball. It it was a drunken slave owner. I don't know why. It just, that's, that's. Yeah. Is that what it was all that all those years? <laughs> he had a jug with XXX on it in one <laughs> hand and a whip in the other. Yeah, it really was time that they changed that mascot to the quantum worms then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I've just derailed us, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I found this movie really, really fun. And again, I just I wanted to, uh, I guess, congratulate Kevin Feige with this insanely good track record that he's had. I mean, once this is all done, once they stop making a gazillion dollars, these Marvel movies and they, or, you know, the, the two or three in a row suck and the uh, thing is broken or he retires. Cause sometimes you need to do that. You need to retire from basketball before yeah. you start. You to retire slip. while you're on top and don't come back and play for the wizards. Like, Several years later. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. It's someday in the future, people will look back at this as the, you know, most impressive producerial run, you know, maybe of all time, maybe of the 21st century. But uh, yeah, I really enjoyed Ant-Man and the Wasp, and I had never been a fan of either of those characters, and I didn't even like the first movie, and I just... I don't know. They're three for three in 2018 for me. But uh, it, it also did well enough. I'm sure we will get a third Ant-Man. And I don't know if you call it Ant-Man and the Wasp and the Ghost or uh, <laughs> Ant-Man 3 or Just, what, what, what would you... What? Lots more and those in there. Ant-Man and the Wasp and the Ghost and 
yellow jacket. And and the hornet. The brown hornet. Oh, wait, you can't be the brown hornet because Bill Cosby has been disgraced as well. Just the hornet. Is the hornet a, a thing in uh, Marvel? Not to my knowledge. Hmm. I was just naming another flying insect that's similar. Okay. But well, they did have a moth in there. A scary giant moth that got the <laughs> dust all over the other car. <laughs> Maybe it could be the moth. I should have asked if that freaked Jeff out. Remember my buddy Jeff was terrified of moths. I mean, like, unnaturally so. To the point where you'd just be like, ah, ah. <laughs> You know, c- kind of like, do you remember there was this time when you heard a sound downstairs and you you were in your underwear and you went down and there was a crazed junkie in your garage? Do you remember that? I do, yeah. And he was eating the cat, I believe. Uh-huh. Or, not the cat that you currently have, obviously, but it was no. the, the predecessor. Or was it the cat? If he was eating the cat, he would have been appreciated and not uh, looked back on as a scary event. So it wasn't the cat. Anyway, your reaction to the... I, I imagine your reaction to the unwelcome visitor in the middle of the night was is similar to how Jeff responds to moths. Wow, how did I get on this? Um, what did you think of the daughter, the little girl? She was cute. I liked her. Was she the same girl? I was wondering about that during the movie. That's the weird thing is she did not look like the same girl to me, but she was. She was? Same actress. She just, I guess that's what three years can do to a person. <laughs> Behold the ravages, the ravages of age. Of age. <laughs> but she is also a Marvel character cassie lang is called stinger in the comics she is a superhero as well and so when he was going into the quantum realm they said something about time in there and i felt like okay this line about time time uh, not working the same way or you know the, the temporal drift or whatever they were talking about i thought this is here to set something up And so what's weird is I thought he was going to run into Cassie as Stinger, like Cassie as a teen or as a grown woman from the future because she talked about how she wanted to get his back and she wanted to be a superhero. And I thought that that Mm -hmm. was setting things up for this moment. But of course it wasn't. It was just, oh, you know, we acknowledge that half the people on Earth died, guys. Don't think that that slipped our minds. It could be setting something up, though, you know? If time, something's weird about time, he might wind up with the older version of his daughter, and she might be there to help him and get his back as part of the story, and then things get restored to the way they were, and all of a sudden, here she is, she's just a little child again. But where do you tell that and story? Got a, had a glimpse of her future and stuff. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it could be part of Avengers Infinity War, or maybe it's not. Maybe it's Ant-Man 3. Ant-Man yeah, if... and the Wasp and the Stinger. Huh? Okay, hey, I, I can live with that. <laughs> if Scott Lang is not in Avengers 4, then you can just, yeah, pick up that story you know, whenever they do that next movie. I'm assuming three years from now, right? They seem to like doing the three-year space gap thing. Yeah. Three years and three movies, and that's all you get. Well, that I don't appreciate, but uh, we talked about that before. It's just, yeah. It is just, yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's the guy that uh, wins $500 on, on the game show. And they're like, all right, do you want to risk going on to $1,000 or do you... He's like, no, no, I'm done. Yeah, 500 is good. He's like, whoa, 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 no, we have to fill 22 minutes with this show. It's like, yeah, 500 is fine. I'm, I'm good. There's another guy back there behind the curtain. Just call him out. Yeah, there, Man-Thing hasn't had a <laughs> movie in a while. We'll seed the stage to him. <laughs> o- okay. If anybody can do it, you can. Kevin, I'm going to go enjoy retirement. There you go. That sums up those decisions for me. In, in, in a- the three movies and out, everybody only gets a trilogy. Yeah, I, I, I can see that as being a bummer. I wonder, <laughs> this is going to get us way off topic, but 
Do you know whether the fox thing went through? Has that finished off? It's still yeah, up in the air. It looks like it's going to go through. There was a competing bid that was really, really high. And then Disney was just like, yeah, we made mm-hmm. some money just in the back room of Cinderella's castle <laughs> and, or Sleeping Beauty's castle. And uh, and so, yeah, here's our new bid. And they're like, oh, OK. But so, so there's still a, a slight chance that it will fall apart. But, yeah, it looks likely. Because, you know, at a certain point, if they keep doing this with all these characters, because they've had three Thors, they've had three Iron Mans, they've had three Captain Americas, so they all got to be done. And they're now two through Ant-Man, two through uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. And they've added in some new ones. You know, we've got Black Panther. We've got Captain Marvel about to come out with her first one. But at a certain point, who are they going to keep bringing in? Is it going to be Man-Thing? You know, I don't think so. But now that they're getting back all the Fox properties, I guess it can just start moving into the X-Men and the Fantastic Four. When it comes down to it, I mean, you've seen some of those posters that they make where they put all the, all the characters from Marvel Universe in them, and there's an insanely large number of characters, so I suppose they can just keep going forever. Well, it, I would trust whatever Kevin Feige puts out there at this point. The guy is just... He's earned my goodwill. So if he says, you know, we're going to do a Masters of Evil movie next. Really? A a movie where the bad guys are the protagonists? I was like, yep. And a guy that's dressed in an orange shark costume? Yes. Oh, okay. I I would still go to it. (laughs) Like, Sony is doubling down on their, uh, (laughs) we're going to make our own Spider-Man universe movies without Spider-Man in them. Because I guess they the test screenings for Venom have gone really, really well. And so, yeah, they're going to make a, a Black Cat and Silver Sable movie. And they're going to make a Silk movie. And obviously they're making the animated Miles Morales movie. And they just announced that uh, Jared Leto or Leto wants to be Morbius in a Morbius movie. In it. And so the whole time I'm just like shaking my head and thinking like, I don't know that any of these projects can work. But... We'll we'll see. Yeah. I expect that most likely the first one of those will come out and go nowhere and then there will be no more of them. But yeah, maybe maybe the Venom one will do really well and I'm totally wrong. I don't know. Yeah, I I don't know either. I have to admit the trailer didn't suck. I thought, oh you know, there maybe there may be a movie in there. Whereas I said that they're, you know, making a Venom movie without Spider-Man in it was Suicide. Suicide Squad. Even that had Batman in it. That's true, I guess. <laughs> but anyhow, sorry. Yeah, I, I, we've got at least one more of these Ant-Man movies. And, you know, it, it, what if the next one was not called Ant-Man and the, the next one is called The Wasp just by itself? I, I would go see that. It will be interesting. And, and they've been talking about doing a solo Black Widow movie for a while. So I assume sometime before they run out of titles, they will uh, announce, what do they call Wave 4? What do they call the each group of Marvel film releases? Phase. It'll be Phase 4. We'll see where they go from here. But uh, again, I feel like the, the track record is just really, really great. We're watching one of those sports teams. How long can they keep this streak going? It's like watching the Patriots back in the Super Bowl again. And you're like, seriously, how? Is it I mean, when Tom Brady retires? Is that when they're going to finally stop? Or is it freaking the coach? And he's never, oh my gosh, I want somebody <laughs> else. Or seeing LeBron James and uh, Steph Curry in the NBA Finals four years in a row. Well, I'm I'm not a big fan of tennis, so I, I you know I don't really recognize those <laughs> names. But but anyhow, uh, any 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 final words? So thumbs up or thumbs down on on Ant Man and the Wasp? I give it a thumbs up. I I enjoyed it. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't reach as high of thumbs up as the first one, but I still really liked it. Okay. 
yeah, I, I would like to see this again just for the fun of uh, shrinking and going large and small. And like the scene where he was child size at the elementary school. I, I don't know. There's something super delightful about seeing those two <laughs> together. And, and it was very convincing, the size discrepancy. That, they, they, obviously, they are having fun making these movies. Yeah, they're coming up with good stuff. So there we go. All right. That's it for the Marvel Cinematic Universe this year. Yeah. We'll be back again in 2019, really? Well, we'll, we'll have long white beards in 2019, so right? I guess, but we'll be back with Captain Marvel with long white beards. <laughs> All right. Spider friends. Sorry, Ant-Man friends. Excelsior. Excelsior. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. We will talk to you later. I think we will. Goodbye. I think Big is right. What? Wait, who was that? Oh, shoot. Ghost is here with her creepy eyes. Ah! <laughs> Let's just hit stop quick before it gets worse. That Gids My Goat is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license for some reason. What did you think of uh, Stan's little cameo? I have no opinion on it at all. I I just, I like that he keeps doing it. I felt like this one was really forgettable, but yeah, that's, can, that's fine. Yeah, I just remember his line being something cheesy. I can't remember even what he said, but I thought it was lame. <laughs> there you go. But no, actually we saw Ant-Man and the Wasp. That is the official title, right? Yes. Or you could call it Marvel's okay. Ant-Man and the Wasp if you want to be super pedantic. Oh, okay. So it's like that. I'm sure I've mentioned this before, but uh, we played that... Uh, Seen it. What's that game called that you played with the DVD? Seen it. Seen it. That's it. We played Seen It. The Disney Seen It. And every stupid question had that as the answer. You couldn't say, oh, that was Dumbo. No, it was Disney's Dumbo. They wrote that on every card for every movie, even though it was the Disney scene it. Like, we really needed to know. We already knew it was all Disney, and they still put that on every title. Hate. Yes, the hate is flowing through me. My, the hate has made me stronger. And here we are with a Disney property, Marvel, that does the same thing. Have they always done that with their movies? Was it Marvel's Iron Man? I mean, I, I don't know that they do it on everything. I mean, we saw, it, you know, Marvel's Avengers, right? Mm -hmm. To uh, separate it from the BBC's Avengers. Right. But, uh, yeah, I don't even know if it was Marvel's Ant-Man and the Wasp. I'm just used to uh, all these <laughs> trademarks expiring, and now they have to say Marvel's Man-Thing. And you're like, Ooh. Although they definitely would say, and now back to Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., wouldn't they? Probably. But that well, that might just be because nobody knows it otherwise. It's not like you have to say Marvel's Spider-Man. But Marvel's Ant-Man is probably a little more important. <laughs> Everybody's like, who the hell is Ant-Man? Ant-Man is another one of those characters. Did they come out the same year as the Galaxy... Uh, Galaxy Quest? The Great Galaxy Fighters? The Guardians of the Galaxy, did that happen the same year? No, it was the or next year. It was very close after it. Guardians though, of right? the Galaxy came out the same year as uh, Winter Soldier. Uh-huh. So Ant-Man was after Guardians of the Galaxy, though, right? Yes. So, okay. But they, they yeah, they, I don't know, man. That just, both of those surprised me still that they had the chutzpah to lay it on the line like that and say, yeah, no, we're going with these ones. That's what we picked. And... Pull it off on top of that.